But another question that we might want to ask is what did he believe about the soul? This one's a much more complicated question because he does seem to shift around a little bit, but he certainly was unorthodox on the soul. So in the 1690s, he penned a manuscript, which is now uh, down in South Central LA in the Clark Library, which includes a section where he quotes passages from the Bible uh, to argue that when you're dead, you're unconscious, and you're not conscious again until the resurrection. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, which are, uh, uh, of them which are asleep, that sorrow, not even as other uh, which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For the Lord shall descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet them in the air. Okay, yeah, this is actually out of order, so let me do it this way. I'm going to do it backwards. Um, were not men greatly prejudiced, they would consider such texts of Scripture as these. In death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall give thee thanks? Psalm 6 and 5. Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave, thy wonders in the dark, and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? Psalm 88, 11 and 12. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. Psalm 115 and 17. The dead know not anything. There is no work, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave. Ecclesiastes 9, 5, and 10. The grave cannot praise thee. Death cannot celebrate thee. Isaiah 38, verse 18. God hath begotten us again unto a, live, a lovely hope. That's, I think, meant to be lively. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance in heaven. 1 Peter 1, 3, 4 which is as much to say that without the resurrection there is no hope nor no inheritance in heaven and to the same purpose speaks uh, Saint Paul and then the passage that I read initially. So what we see here again is somewhat similar to what we saw with the Trinity that he's beginning to move sharply away from uh, the orthodox idea that everyone has a soul that is in us that departs from the body and goes to heaven at death. Newton moves away from this view, looks at passages in the Bible that confirm that when we're dead, we're unconscious, we don't exist. He still seems to be thinking in terms of after the resurrection, people going uh, to heaven, although he also believes the saints will spend time on earth. So he hasn't quite let go of the idea of going to heaven, but he certainly has let go of this idea that when you die, you immediately go to heaven. So he believes the intermediate state between death and resurrection is a, a state of unconsciousness, uh, of non-existence. So that's roughly where he was in the 1690s. Uh, we're still working on his theology. I'm working with another scholar on a paper on this uh, uh, topic, his theology of, of, of the soul. So people who believe that there is no mortal soul are called mortalists. People who believe that there is and immortal soul uh, are sometimes called immortalists, right? So Newton uh, begins to take the view that uh, we don't have this sort of platonic soul, which uh, many people believe uh, that we have. There's a couple other passages that uh, hint at this. Well, there, there are a couple, there's a couple other passages that I'm going to show you tonight. There are many other passages. We don't have time to look at them all. Uh, here's a note that a Scottish mathematician who was visiting Newton in May 1694 wrote, not a separate existence of the soul, but a resurrection with a continuation of memory is the requirement of religion. This seems maybe a little bit enigmatic, so what is uh, Gregory saying, or what was Newton saying? Because this is a record of what Newton said. Well, one common argument in favor of the immortal soul is that you need to have an immortal soul for your personality to continue to exist, right? So through your life and then after your death when your body is destroyed, your personality continues and then in the resurrection the soul rejoins the body, etc., etc. So that's an argument that's made by people who believe in what is called natural immortality, that we're naturally immortal. So Newton's saying we don't need a soul for our personality continue, to continue because God holds our memories. He's omnipotent. He's, he's, he's 
uh, infinitely powerful, he holds our memories of who we are, and that's who, you know, what we are, our personalities based on our memories, etc. And he can recreate those. Now, if you think about it, what Newton is saying is that if you believe in a powerful God who has complete sovereignty and complete dominion, you don't need a soul. And in fact, this is very consistent with Newton's thinking because Newton comes to believe in a very powerful God who is always sovereign over every event uh, throughout uh, time. And so there is something that God can't destroy if there is such a thing as an immortal soul. And for this, Newton is un, uh, an unpalatable uh, idea. I've got one more example on the soul. That the resurrection from the dead is called living again, and therefore between death and the resurrection, men do not live. Very logical. That men are rewarded at Christ's coming, not before. So he was concerned with this idea that the soul goes to heaven that's a reward, but the judgment doesn't come until later, till the resurrection. So Newton feels that this is backwards and concludes that that doesn't make sense. So there is no reward, there is no immortality until the resurrection and until judgment. So he's coming out of the orthodox position, may not have completely let go of every aspect of it. We're not sure because we don't have a complete knowledge of uh, his theology over time, but we have these tantalizing uh, clues.